Hi, everyone. Sorry about the delay. I like to let everyone in from the waiting room before we begin. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. I'm Joanna Yaz, Readings and Special Programs Manager of the NYU Creative Writing Program. Before we begin, please take a moment to make sure your audio is muted, though we welcome you to keep your cameras on. The chat will be open in case you'd like to use it to react to the readings or simply say hello. I'll occasionally be sharing links related to the writer's work in the chat as well. At the very end, you'll have a chance to unmute yourselves and applaud to say congratulations. It's truly an honor to present tonight's terrific lineup. Jameson Fitzpatrick, Raven Leilani, Maura Roosevelt, and Sarah M. Sala. Each writer received their MFA from our, from our program and each has recently published their debut book. One of the hardest things for me about working at this program is having to say goodbye to our brilliant graduates every year. But by far the most enjoyable thing about hosting this series is having the opportunity to see you again, to celebrate you and your beautiful books. Whether it's a virtual stage like this one, or our beloved writer's house on West 10th Street, or wherever we may find ourselves next, who knows, you'll always be part of the NYU CWP family and we'll welcome you with open arms. I'll now introduce all four writers in the order they'll be reading, which is alphabetical. Jameson Fitzpatrick is the author of the poetry collection Pricks in the Tapestry, published with Birds LLC this year, as well as the chapbooks Mr. And with Indolent Books, and Morris Rowe, Erasures, with 89 plus Luma Publications, a recipient of fellowships from the Pocantico Center and the New and the NIFA NISCA, and sorry, New York State Council on the Arts. Fitzpatrick now teaches in the expository writing program here at NYU. Raven Leilani's debut novel, Luster, was published with FSG in 2020. Her work has been published in Granta. McSweeney's, Yale Review, Conjunctions, The Cut, New England Review, and many other places. Maura Roosevelt has taught critical and creative writing at NYU and USC. Her novel, Baby of the Family, published in 2019 with Dutton, was developed from a short story of the same title, which was published in Joyland Magazine and given an award for most read story of the year. Maura is also the great granddaughter of Eleanor and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Sarah M. Sala is the author of the poetry collection Devil's Lake, published with Tolson Books in 2020, the founding director of Office Hours Poetry Workshop and co-poetry editor for the Bellevue Literary Review. She teaches expository writing at NYU also. Her work appears or is forthcoming in Baum, the Southampton Review, and the Brooklyn Rail. Without further ado, we'll start with our next reader, our first reader, Jameson Fitzpatrick. Thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, and thank you to everybody at NYU for inviting us here. I'm so excited to be reading alongside three writers whom I admire so much uh, and to be here with all of you and see so many friends in the Zoom grid. Selected Boys, 2003 to 2008. Boys in the woods, beating off, off the beaten, between the barn and sand pit, seemed bigger once, with their pants down, around their ankles. Boys leaning against trees, rubbing up against trunks. Boys raw, boys wiping up with leaves. Boys in bathrooms, at school, in class. Boys in tights, boys in dance belts. Boys backstage, during the show. Boys after hours in empty studios. Boys in cars, taking off, not wearing seat belts taking off their belts, boys in back seats, boys in front seats, boys in trunks, boys swimming half naked across the pond or pool or summer, skimming stones, boys streaking starlight through the dark, boys in basements, boys sprouting hair in all the places parts come together, boys coming together, boys leaving separately 15 minutes apart, then meeting in the park, boys getting drunk, boys getting stoned, boys getting blown, boys fucking raw, boys like Jack, Dave, Brandon, Justin, John, Chris, 
Michael, Daniel, Mark, Matt, Drew, Mark again, Brian, Zach, Kevin, Josh, Nick, who died, who's counting? Scintilla, star. In the old place, there was no place that did not see me. Wherever I went, mothers whispered about me like a Greek chorus. I heard that boy. I heard that. I was just a boy. But it was true what they said, that I liked other boys, that I had stolen Sarah's, though he was four years older and they were very much in love. I made him break up with her in a Chili's parking lot while I waited inside. I was 14. How humbling to have been 14, to have eaten at that Chili's often. That summer I had no taste for anything but him, faintly of chlorine. When he left for college, I had no one. Sarah's friends stared me down at school. I found it was better if I could not be no one to be someone, small but particular, specified, which was an apprenticeship for special. Cold, another word for cool. Duplicity. Whenever I am in one conversation, I am thinking about another. Whatever room I am in, my heart is not. Before a mirror, which face is true? The one that moves or the one that is moved? I flip a coin and wish for the opposite. Life, friends, is whoring. A warning a man mistakes for intimacy. When I miss my madness, which I mostly don't, I miss how totally I was inside it. The idea I could not get out. And this next one, I was very happy a few years out of the program to have appear in Washington Square, uh, which is why I thought I would read it uh, tonight. Frantic efforts to avoid abandonment real or imagined. And the title comes from the DSM uh, Diagnostic Criteria for Borderline Personality Disorder. Once I wove flowers into his bicycle spokes, I wrote please on the wall in large letters. I wrote letters. Many times I made a scene. Once I cast a spell, I told him I could keep him beautiful. I chased after him in the street, calling his name. I was always it. I showed up at the party knowing he would be there and went home with him. I showed up at the party not knowing he would be there and went home with him. I texted twice more after it was clear he didn't want to sleep with me again. I learned about sympathetic magic in class then got a signature tattooed on my ass. I followed him onto the subway platform. I followed him on every platform. I told him I would die without him. I died. That was the worst thing. No, coming back was the worst thing, haunting him. I wore a disguise, sang the Stevie Nicks song right in his face. You'll never get away from the sound of the woman that loves you. I paid for it, slept with his friend, several of them claimed squatter's rights. I waited by the door. I wrapped my arms around him. I turned him into a tree. I climbed, carved our initials into the bark. I jumped. Where I landed, I didn't know the language. I repeated his name in a mirror until he appeared. I broke the mirror trying to get to him. I broke two. I turned him into a flower. I turned him into a pig. I cooked him breakfast. I did the dishes. I learned the language. I devised a plot. I devised a plot of such sophistication he'd never suspect. I stole his passport. I made everyone he loved love me. Once I told the truth about everything. I lied. I was extravagant. I was simple. I was a good piece of furniture. I was his favorite shirt.
This next poem I wrote for my friend Wiley, who uh, was in the program with me. Oh. What did you look like when they pulled you from the river? Were you shirtless again? Remember the afternoon we kept like a private joke, what we tried and failed? Does this poem fail you? Does it keep you alive in the sunny spot on the floor where you went to lie like a dog when you left the bed? Come here, you said. I'm sorry. Come here anyway and let me hold you. And this last poem I'll read is the last poem in the book, which is called Story of My Life. Two desires, like twins, I tend to, the one to be and the other to hold. The first looks like envy when the brunette in cowboy boots cycles past smoking a cigarette, her hair in a French braid. She isn't sweating like I am through my shirt for the third time today. She doesn't hurry. Or later in the park where I am killing time, when the woman on rollerblades shows me the shape of what I sit on the edge of, the same cobbled circle as always, looping and looping in a short dress, pixie cut, perfect pour de bras, her own music in her ears. I read a book about a woman who loves a man. I relate my own music. Now the other desire cries out as though I can only neglect him for so long. And there he is, this time taking the form of a skateboarder, so lithe and dark-haired it hurts to look at him, though of course I can't stop, knowing I'll have to go eventually, or he will, and then I may never again have the pleasure of looking at him. The pain, I mean, in my teeth. I think of an Elaine Scary line, the first demand of beauty is to keep looking. But when I go to look it up later, it's not there. In fact, I wrote it in my notes on the book where I thought I'd find it, the one about beauty and justice and error. He's not very good. At skateboarding, I mean, he can't quite clear the base of the statue that's drawn him here and keeps tumbling away from his board. Scary says the first demand of beauty is replication. I've already written this poem in this park, though it was a different statue and a different man. Is desire without pain possible? Is desire possible without pain? Really? I want to know. I want to stop writing this poem. I want him to say, yes, and how graceful she is, avoiding his orphaned board as it rolls her way. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Um, what an act to follow. Uh, it, it is really, really special to be here um, and I'm just going to read from my book and I'm gonna start from the beginning. Uh, thank you for having me. The first time we have sex, we are both fully clothed at our desk during working hours, bathed in blue computer light. He is uptown processing a new bundle of microfiche and I'm downtown handling corrections for a new Labrador detective manuscript. He tells me what he ate for lunch and asks if I can manage to take off my underwear and my cubicle without anyone noticing. His messages come with impeccable punctuation. He is fond of words like taste and spread. The empty text field is full of possibilities. Of course, I worry about IT remoting into my computer or my internet history, warranting yet another meeting with HR, but the risk. 
the thrill of a third pair of unseen eyes. The idea that someone in the office with that sweet post-lunch break optimism might come across this thread and see how tenderly Eric and I have built this private world. In his first message, he points out a few typos in my online profile and tells me it's an open marriage. His profile pictures are candid and loose, a grainy photo of him asleep in the sand, a photo of him shaving, taken from behind. It is his last photo that moves me, the dirty tile and soft procession of steam, his face in the mirror, stern with quiet scrutiny. I save the photo to my phone so I can look at it on the train. Women look over my shoulder and smile, and I let them believe he is mine. Otherwise, I have not had much success with men. This is not a statement of self-pity. This is just a statement of the facts. Here's a fact. I have great breasts which have warped my spine. More facts. My salary is very low. I have trouble making friends and men lose interest in me when I talk. It always goes well initially, but then I talk too explicitly about my ovarian torsion or my rent. Eric is different. Two weeks into our correspondence, he tells me about the cancer that ravaged half his maternal family. He tells me about the aunt he loved who made potions with fox hair and hemp, how she was buried with a corn husk doll she made of herself. Still, he describes his childhood home lovingly, the digressions of farmland between Milwaukee and Appleton, the yellow-breasted chaps in tundra swans that would appear in his yard looking for seed. When I talk about my childhood, I only talk about the happy parts, the tape of Spice World I received for my fifth birthday, the Barbie I melted in the microwave when no one was home. Of course, the context of my childhood, the boy bands, the Lunchables, the impeachment of Bill Clinton, only emphasize our generational gap. Eric is sensitive about his age and about mine, and he makes a considerable effort to manage a 23-year discrepancy. He follows me on Instagram and leaves lengthy comments on my posts. Retired internet slang interspersed with earnest remarks about how the light falls on my face. Compared to the inscrutable advances of younger men, it is a relief. We talk for a month before our schedule line. We try to meet earlier, but things always come up. This is just one way his life is different from mine. There are people who count on him, and sometimes they need him urgently. Between his abrupt cancellations, I realize that I need him too, in a way that makes my dreams delirious expressions of thirst, long stretches of yellow desert, cathedrals hemmed in dripping moss. By the time we set our first real date, I would have done anything. He wanted to go to Six Flags. We decide to go on a Tuesday. When he rolls up in his white Volvo, I've only made it to the part of my pre-date routine where I try to find the most appropriate laugh. I put on, I put on three dresses for a fire find the right one. I tie up my braids and line my eyes. There are dishes in the sink and a pervasive salmon smell in the apartment, and I don't want him to think it has anything to do with me. I put on a complex pair of underwear that is not so much underwear as a bundle of string, and I stand before the mirror. I think to myself, you're a desirable woman. You are not a dozen gerbils in a skin casing. Outside, he is double parked. He leans against the car and remains like this as I come out, his eyes bright and still. His hair is darker than I expected, a black so opaque it looks blue. His face is almost obscenely symmetrical, though one of his eyebrows is higher than the other, and it makes his smile seem a little smug. It is the second day of summer, and all the city's powers have no sway over him. I reach for his hand, trying not to swallow my tongue, and something feels strange. Of course there are nerves. In person, he's a total daddy, his face alert and hard, softened only by the slight recession of his hair. But this strange feeling has nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with me looking past his sensuous mouth and slightly askew nose for any indication that he's as nervous as I am. It is that it is 8.15 a.m., and I feel happy. I'm not on the L, smelling someone's lukewarm pickles, wishing I were dead. Edie, I say, extending my hand. I know, he says, his long fingers settling between mine, too gently. I want it to be more forward, to fold him into an easy extroverted hug. But what happens is this limp handshake, this aversion of my eyes, this unsurprising and immediate surrender of power. And then the worst part of meeting a man in broad daylight, the part where you see him seeing you, deciding in the split second whether any future cunnilingus will be enthusiastic or perfunctory. He opens the door, and there is a fluffy blue dye hanging from the rearview mirror, a half-eaten bag of Jolly Ranchers in the passenger seat. His correspondence online has been honest, full of his stuttering sincerity. However, as we have already told the stories you might tell on a first date, it is harder to begin. He brings up the weather, and then we are talking about climate change. After a while of talking generally about burning to death, we pull into the park. 
It's hard not to be aware of the age discrepancy when you are surrounded by the most rococo trappings of childhood. The Tweety Bird balloons, the plastic soulless eyes of the Paz mascot, the Dippin' Dots. As we enter the gates, I feel the high fructose sun of the park like an insult. This is a place for children. He has taken me to a place for children. I watch his face for any indication that this might be a joke or a telling manifestation of his anxiety about the near 23 years I've spent on Earth. The age discrepancy doesn't bother me. Beyond the fact of older men having more stable finances and different understanding of the clitoris, there is the potent drug of a keen power imbalance, of being caught in the excruciating limbo between their disinterest and expertise, their panic at the world's growing indifference, their rage and adult failure, funneled into the reduction of your body into gleaming elastic parts. Except for him, this seems to be new territory, not simply to be out on a date with someone who is not his wife and decades younger, but to be out with a girl who happens to be black. I can feel it in how cautiously he says African-American, how he absolutely refuses to say the word black. As a rule, I try to avoid popping that dusty cherry. I cannot be the first black girl a white man dates. I cannot endure the nervous renditions of backpacker rap, conspicuous effort to be colloquial, or the smugness of pink men in kinta cloth. As we make our way over to lockers, a father and son are vomiting behind a Bugs Bunny Sandee. I open my locker and there's a diaper inside. Eric sees it and calls over a janitor. He says he's sorry, and the apology feels like it is not only about the diaper, but more about how this choice of location is turning out. I feel bad about that. I feel bad that my first instinct is to manage his feelings instead of suggesting somewhere else to go. That we will both have to endure my attempt to prove over the course of the state that I'm having a good time and that this is not his fault. A month is too long to talk online. In the time we have been talking, my imagination has run wild. Based on his liberal use of a semicolon, I just assumed this date would go well, but everything is different IRL. For one thing, I'm not as quick on my feet. There is no time to consider my words or to craft the clever response in iOS notes. There is also the fact of body heat, the inarticulable part of being close to a man, the sweet, feral thing underneath their cologne, the way it sometimes feels as if there were no whites to their eyes, a man's profound adrenal craziness, the tenuousness of his restraint. I feel it on me and inside me, like I'm being possessed. When we talked online, we both did some work to fill in the blanks. We filled them in optimistically, with the kind of yearning that brightens and distorts. We had elaborate hypothetical dinners, and we talked about the doctor's appointments we were afraid to make. Now there are no blanks, and when he rubs the sunblock into my back, it is both too little and too much. Is this okay, he asks, his breath hot on the back of my neck. Uh-huh, I say. Try not to make the contact into more than it is. However, his hands are excellent. They are warm and wide and soft, and I have not been laid in months. For a moment, I'm sure I'm going to cry, which is not unusual, because I cry often and everywhere, and most especially because of this one Olive Garden commercial. I excuse myself and run to the bathroom, where I look into the mirror and reassure myself that there are bigger things in the moment I am in. Gerrymandering, genealogy conglomerate selling my cheek swabs to the state, of course, there's still the business of trying to look sexy while hurtling across the sky. Like most white people who eat beans in the woods, undeterred by the fresh fecal evidence of hungry bears, Eric finds his mortality and soft meaty body a petty, incidental thing. I, on the other hand, am acutely aware of all the ways I might die. So when the sighing teenage park associate slaps my harness down and slogs over to the levers, I think of all my unfinished, unfinished business the quart of pistachio gelato in my freezer, the 1.5 wanks off in my half-dead vibrator, and Mr. Rogers' box set. Eric's enthusiasm is infectious. After the first two rides, I am enjoying myself, and not just because dying means I won't have to pay my student loans. He laces his fingers into mine and drags me to the front, apparently serious enough about his park experience to pay the extra fee to skip the line. I go to tie my shoelaces and return to find him talking to the porky pig mascot about entry-level positions at the archive. We always need quality customer service, he says, pressing his phone number into porky's pink felt mitt. We board the highest coaster in the park for the third time, and he screams like it is the first. He really, truly screams. At first, it is off-putting, but as we scale the last track, I realize that I like it. I like it a lot. I can't decide if it's this dissonance, the girliness of this inclination compared to his mass, or my envy at his wonder, the glee in his terror, the willingness to experience anew what is familiar. 
His joy is raw in a way that makes me feel like I can unzip my skin suit and show him all the ooze inside, but not yet. There's a sadness about his fervor, the way it feels slightly put on, as if he has something to prove. He looks over at me when we reach the top, the wind carved through his hair. Behind his eyes, I see myself fractured into pieces. Suddenly it feels this painful, the ordinary, to be this open to him as he looks at me and pretends I'm not just a cheaper version of a fast Italian car. I wish every day could be like this, he says, when you reach the most terrifying part of the ride, when they hold you in midair and force you to anticipate the drop. Below us, the park is turning on its lights. All I want for him is to have what he wants. I want to be uncomplicated and undemanding. I want no friction between his fantasy and the person I actually am. I want all that and I want none of it. I want the sex to be familiar and tepid, for him to be unable to get it up, for me to be too open about my IBS so that we are bonded in mutual consolation. I want us to fight in public, and when we fight in private, I want him to maybe accidentally punch me. I want us to have a long, fruitful bird watching career, and then I want us to find out we have cancer at exactly the same time. Then I remember his wife. The coaster eases downward, and we fall. Despite myself, I have been thinking about his wife all day. I find myself hoping she is a vocal participant in the neighborhood watch. It would also be reassuring if she lies completely still during sex. There is a possibility that she might be cool, that she might truly be fine with her husband going out on a date with a girl who has 16 times more viable eggs. She might be limber, keyed into Venus retrograde, and inclined to use natural deodorant. A, a woman so unthreatened by all of New York's women that she has given this new little horde a wholesale, breath, a wholesale blessing to fuck her husband. After a few more rounds, Eric and I head to the coast saloon with a surprising abundance of wicker. It is this one restaurant in the park allowed to sell alcohol, and above the bar is a neon rendition of Yosemite Sam's handlebar mustache. A waitress wearing a 10-gallon hat tosses a couple sticky menus on the table. She tells us to specials in such a way that we know our sole responsibility as patrons in our section is to go right ahead and fuck ourselves. Up until this moment, we have been riding the day side by side. I look at him directly, and it almost hurts. His undivided attention like a focus point of heat. Are you having a good time, he asks. Yeah, I think so. Because I have to be honest, I'm having trouble reading you, and I'm usually great at that kind of thing, he says. I finish my beer and try not to show how overjoyed I am, and none of my need and loathing will come across. You're kind of aloof, he says, and all the kids stacked underneath my trench coat rejoice. Aloof is a casual lean, a choice. It is not a girl in Bushwick looking, looking clean a can of tuna. I'm an open book, I say, thinking of all the men who found it illegible. I made mistakes with these men. I dope for their legs as they tried to leave my house. I chased them down the hall with a bottle of Listerine, saying, I can be a beach for you. I can get rid of all these clauses. Please, I'll just revise. Oh my goodness, that was wonderful. Um, thanks so much, Raven and Jameson. Um, seriously, I'm like such acts to follow. I'm so I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, and thank you, Joanna and Deborah and all of NYU. Um, I, I've actually, I've been done with the program now for a long time, but it still sort of like feels like home. So um, doing the reading is exciting for me. Um, I am also going to read, I wasn't sure what to read tonight, but I'm going to read from my book, Baby of the Family. Um, and I'm going to read a piece from the middle. The book is about, um, it's about this old fancy aristocratic family that kind of uh, falls from grace, I guess. And um, the patriarch of it, the father is, uh, of this family is married four times. And so this section is about his final wife whose name is uh, Susan Scribner. And this is sort of like, <clears throat> sort of her orig origin story, I guess, that um, takes place in the West Village, right around the writer's house. So I thought it was a, a, good, um, a good thing to read tonight. <laughs> okay. It was 1980 when she found an apartment in the West Village on Bethune Street. The neighborhood was dodgy, but up and coming and her two-room studio was cheaper than anything uptown. Occasionally, needles lay discarded by the building door, and she quickly learned that the man who occupied the apartment next to her, Anthony, 
was a pimp who dealt mostly in young boys. But she was 26. She wore her hair in her orange hair in a retro flip in order to stand out, and she was able to live there by herself. The first five days in her apartment were spent scrubbing off a thick layer of scum that covered everything from the floorboards to the galley kitchen to the window that faced the air chute. <clears throat> she found a part-time elementary school teaching job at the Village Community School on West 10th and had afternoons off to go searching for the elusive thing that she so desperately wanted and needed. Susan didn't know where to begin searching, so she spent most afternoons sitting in bars around the village, sipping cocktails and rereading her tattered copy of what she'd come to think of as her book. She wasn't sure if she was looking to find Jay Gatsby or looking to become him herself. Susan was aware that the most poignant paragraphs of the book did not involve Gatsby, but rather Nick Carraway. Nick, quiet in the crisp West Egg air, under the belt of East Coast stars, looking up at Gatsby's mansion windows. Nick was the one to love, she knew, but Susan simply wasn't interested in quiet reflection and country air. She wanted to pour champagne herself to steer a yacht farther into the sea. So Susan waited for excitement. And as she waited, she drank Cape Codders at Chumley's and at the front bar of the Ninth Circle. Sometimes she went to the Ye, Wa Ye Waverly Inn for a gin fizz. <clears throat> The other regulars were artists and writers and musicians who found the fact that she was a teacher a real trip. On the way home from the community school, she'd pop into the White Horse Tavern or Cafe Minerva and drink a beer with the bartender she'd become friendly with. A few blocks away in Washington Square, <clears throat> the smell of marijuana wafted out of drum circles. Teenagers danced around the defunct fountain with hair 20 years longer than it should have been. They seemed to have no idea that 1980 had arrived. But over on the west side, everyone was aware of what year it was. <clears throat> With each passing month, the gay revolution grew and the streets of the village became an urban wild west. <clears throat> the partying did not only happen on the weekends. On Tuesday and Wednesday afternoons, men walked by in ass assless chaps and one could hear the rustle of blowjobs in the bushes by the pier. <clears throat> Once at 11 in the morning, she walked, into the, uh, she walked into the women's room at John's Pizzeria and a shirtless man on his knees in front of another yelled, get the fuck out, bitch. It was unfortunate. <clears throat> Her apartment was a fourth floor walk up. She was two vodka tonics in and she truly had to pee. Her neighborhood soon became a point of pride for her and part of her identity. She was Susan of the West Village, the red-haired teacher who knew all the Italian grandmothers, all the drag queens, the names of both the white and the Puerto Rican children. <clears throat> she was the friendly Californian who was never without a drink in her hand. A billboard on 7th Avenue stated boldly, gay rights now, and it made Susan swell with pride at her chosen home. <clears throat> AIDS didn't exist yet, and male sex seemed to infect the very air everyone breathed. Kinetic, but also containing testosterone-filled grinding and punching. The good and the bad of this air affected everyone. Straight men turned on sex signals left and right, and Susan hailed them down. <clears throat> this was not suburban California. She was in total control of how calm or how eventful her day would be, and how many drinks accompany accompanied her various events. It was easy to bring men up to her fourth floor or to go to their simil similarly disarrayed apartments. Time passed quickly, and although she was frequently alone, the loneliness and, <clears throat> loneliness and wanting were no longer part of her personality. The itch that had tormented her for most of her life was lifting. After nearly a year at the community school, Susan began to show up late and then miss some mornings altogether. In an environment with very little respect for lesson plans, she had managed to break the rules. Her boss, Judy, was 10 years her, se her senior. When the formerly responsible Susan Scribner showed up for work for the first time all week on a Wednesday morning, Judy and her Coke bottle glasses took Susan into the art supply closet and fired her. We know you've been struggling with drinking, Judy said, her credulous eyes magnified behind the lenses. We wanted to help you, hold you through the process of healing, but it's no longer fair to the children. You've already been drinking today, haven't you? Susan stormed away from the school, covering every ounce of embarrassment with the veneer of rage. 
she felt her childhood desolation rearing its head. She'd begun the morning with vodka straight, as she thought no one could detect the scent of it. But through her seething, she considered that perhaps this was a blessing. Now was her time to go after her dreams. Susan Scribner continued her life on Bethune Street, but it would be hard to say that it wasn't disrupted. Although she hadn't fully explained what happened at the community school, her parents begged her to come back to California. Her nephews were growing old enough to miss her now. But 1981 came and went and Susan subsisted in New York. She wouldn't, couldn't give up her bone deep feeling that important things were coming to her. Larry, a manager of the Village Vanguard, hooked her up with a gig as a background actress for television, mostly on police procedurals. Every few weeks, she'd spend a long and cold day walking back and forth across one city block, being told to stop looking at the camera. This brought in just enough to pay, her rent con to pay for her rent control department. But Bethune Street was changing. Some abandoned townhouses across from her building were being demolished, and rumor had it they would be replaced by a condominium development. Three months passed of her just barely getting by from her acting gigs and the small checks that her mother snuck from her father and mailed to her. She hadn't paid April's rent yet, and it was the 11th. At 3.30 in the morning, she'd gotten home from a man's rented room at the Chelsea Hotel. A tall and blonde hippie who was at the end of his two month stay in New York, about to hit the road again to continue finding himself. At home, Susan watched as the roach colony scattered across the counter when she turned on the light. On her square table sat a strawberry vanilla cake from Rosie's Bakery in Irvine, which her mother had air mailed to her. The next day was her 28th birthday. The card read, another happy year for our city girl. A tall stack of books sat on the hardwood floor, but she hadn't picked one up in months. She lay in bed, staring out the front window, and then kept staring. When the middle alarm clock read 4.52, light began to break through the clouded sky, and she could make out a water tower in the distance. Far away sirens screamed. Then the sound was right outside her building, in and out, a panicked shrieking. She smelled smoke. Through the open window, a fireman in a yellow suit stood spraying a hose on the roof of a building two doors away. There was a clatter, then a banging downstairs in her own building. Then, bang, 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 a deep voice declaring, fire department, everyone must evacuate, evacuate the building immediately. The voice repeated itself in crescendo. <clears throat> then the scrapes of doors opening, the high-pitched barking of dogs abruptly woken. Through the doors, voices traveled, all of them complaining. Italian grandfathers, young mothers speaking Spanish, the husband of that cool married couple. Splayed on her threadbare sheet in ratty underwear and the white camisole she'd gone out in, Susan didn't move. Smoke seeped through her open window now. The din of her neighbors disappeared altogether. She coughed, the smoke was everywhere. It was as if she was paralyzed. She did not get up. Had it been two hours or 10 minutes? Would the fireman on the other roof be the last person she ever saw? Her apartment door began to jerk. Someone was kicking it from the hallway. But the man who pushed his way in was not the rubber-coated fireman she'd expected. Standing in her kitchen was Anthony, her neighbor the pimp. Soon he stood over her bed, tall and thin as a greyhound. The only word that escaped her was a whining no but he scooped her up in two arms and carried her like a bride through the stairwell and out the iron exit door to the roof. <clears throat> Anthony lay Susan down on the cool black stucco where she sat up but didn't thank him. She wasn't wearing a bra or pants. <clears throat> the morning breeze had kicked itself up. It was cool and sweet on all of her limbs. Anthony smiled sheepishly. We've got to move it from here. Firemen cleared the whole place. The two of them hopped over the one foot gap between buildings and did it again, making their way onto the third roof. Then they sat on the curved slope, each person's legs outstretched. It was unseasonably warm on an, for an April morning. They were safe as they watched the sunrise orange, turning the sky blue, lighting up the city. Anthony took out a flat brown wallet, which had a tightly rolled joint in the crook of it. They passed it back and forth, letting the thick smoke curl out of the corner of their mouths. Anthony didn't touch her anywhere or try to kiss her. She told him about California, 
and he in turn told her about growing up in the housing projects that lined the river on the east side of Manhattan. Then he offered her some life advice. You need to find a new place, Carino, a place you'll want to run out of when the shit lights on fire. Susan's eyes seeped with moisture, but she was too stoned to cry. He was right. But the vision of what her life would be if she returned to her family in Orange County strangled all of the breath out of her. She could not go backwards. She needed change to swing something in her direction, push her into a new place. It was pure chance that Nick Carraway had moved in next door to Jay Gatsby in West Egg. Perhaps this veritable stranger saving her life was the first event that would lift her out of this dark chapter on Bethune Street. Indeed, chance struck again three weeks later when Susan discovered that she was pregnant. Sitting on the edge of the tub in her disintegrating pink tiled bathroom, she held a glass test tube in two hands above the closed toilet lid. She would bought a, an at-home pregnancy test kit that morning, and after placing three drops of urine in the test tube, she let it sit in its holder for two hours. <clears throat> now the evidence was clear. A, red, a rust red ring in the middle of the tube pronounced that her body was in the middle of an active pregnancy. She didn't worry about which of the three possible men was the father. She didn't pause to consider if this is what she wanted. Instead, <clears throat> Susan knew, her whole being knew, that this red ring was just what she needed. <laughs> Thanks. So wonderful. Thank you everyone for your readings um, this evening. I'm very honored to be here, to be here to gather together in this space. It feels like I'm somewhere tonight with all of you. So that's transporting me into this space is, is wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna read some poems uh, from Devil's Lake, which came out in August. It still feels a little bit surreal, which is awesome. Um, this first one is called Hydrogen. You wanna talk bang? Hydrogen was there at 100 hours in the Coke colored velodrome of dark matter. Gases checking gases ad infinitum. Chartreuse flare, then a deafening birth. Ions of cosmos cartwheeling pink, red, yellow, green, purple, blue, black in the sphere of night. First, I was a star, then a stain of water, then a kindergartner. My little puppy in the background uh, might pipe up from Time to time, that's okay. He likes to comment on uh, writing in my classes as well. He's a pretty good critic. He's tough, but he's fair. This is called Nature versus Nature. Before I was born, my original face radiated light, weather, organisms, landforms, celestial bodies, everything untouched by humans. This is called Blue Dog, Blue Dog. Back when I went to classrooms to teach instead of on the Zooms. Blue Dog. Mid-sentence, while teaching a freshman seminar, a stranger in a Blue Dog costume enters. Blue Dog paces in eerily without saying a word, mimes his threadbare mitts for us to carry on. I search the shadow box of mesh beneath its battered plastic eyes for any indication of what's next. Where an ID card should rest, an empty plastic case swings. When Blue Dog speaks, his voice is crushed gravel. One time I buried a bone. I buried a bone and then I dug it up. A part of me leaves my body. When it's over, he walks out. Five days later, an Oregon Community College student shoots his English teacher and nine others. The gunman says, I've wanted to do this for years. I actually met someone who um, was the child of someone who taught at Oregon Community College. And she thanked me for writing this poem for acknowledging um, that it's tough to be a teacher in these spaces. Um, I think a lot of times I write about the news as um, a memorial so that we can't forget about these things. This is called On My Back, after Leanne Maxey. American insults lie in the body. They flail across the knife. 
I study the green air plants threaded across a chain link fence. The matchsticks of your life startled clean and blazing. Observe a palette of flesh tones disappear into starless denim. Reduction its own form of bloodshed. So much depends upon the landscape before its wildness leeches away. The viewer's assumptions thrown back at her as if to say, my queerness is the most natural thing I inhabit. I'm turning the book sideways now because there's some horizontal aligned poems. Just fun for me to make printing things difficult. This is called American Ammunition. With our revolutionary safe action trigger system, the G17 9x19 pistol is safe, easy, and quick. Just what you need in high pressure situations. Glock.com. One, a public cafeteria. The ghost of my heart gorges herself on spent ammunition. The Orlando medical examiner processed each of the 49 pulse victims apart from the gunman. Even amid gravitational collapse, surviving atoms couldn't reanimate with him. Two, I forget my hands in the grocery store, 10 ring digits in a bed of Brussels sprouts. My voice becomes a skateboard ramp. Weather balloons eclipse my eyes. Sudden questions plague me. What is a border crossing? What longitude and latitude in the cosmos do our loved ones recycle toward? Three, empty classrooms become scenarios. I am a cartographer of stairwells, an apostle of pony walls. A ghost appears seeking household items, pauses before the nightstand, opens the drawer to rifle past hand creams, nail files, paperback books. Over here, I say, are you my afterlife? Four, in a dream, I ward off the shooter with blossoms. Cobalt, fuchsia, burnt orange, mustard, turquoise, lime, mallard, gargoyle, snow, oyster, bourbon. A carpet of fragrance to barricade the steel doors. So, it's poetry, which, not, which is not always sad, but often intense. Um, so let's see. I'm going to read some fun erasures now. We can interpret fun how you will. Uh, so these are blackout poems. You take a text. Uh, I, got a, I got a really interesting letter back when I announced my engagement to my partner. Um, so I got some like fan mail back that was like, oh no, uh, you're marrying a lady. So. I was like, how do you process uh, something that makes you feel this private shame? And I was like, make it public. She signed her name. Uh, so these are erasures. On receiving a homophobic letter, a series of erasures. Version one. My dear, I wish I spent more time living, but I've never understood how. Recently, I grabbed a pen. I worked on the answer to my life. I felt a jet, a magnet, a pancake, a chair, a doormat in every cell, every molecule in my body. I'm not sure how. All I can say is I'm super not special. I used to talk to almost anyone and feel great love. I plead to you, go against the fullness you were meant to have. So that's version one, same letter, I was like, I don't know, let's, let's run this again, see what happens. Version two, Sarah, you were unbelievable. You know everyone. You came to mind because I didn't know what to do. At the age of 18, I decided to go down south. I spent three years in my kitchen. Unexplainingly, I lay there with no body. When I stood and said, I really don't know you but you better get your seatbelt on. And I am now filled with his children. I'm so used to miracles, I can't even talk about them. Version three, Sarah, you are my heart. I wish I spent more time to get to know you. At 20, the angels I thought were helping me had to go. 
everything was going south in my marriage. I was in a jet blast with no feeling. I'm not sure how long it was. You're turning a new page. I feel great love for you. You are my heart. You, you, you. Which feels like the ending. But I will also read just the final poem um, in the collection here. This is called Interior versus Exterior. At my worst, I control the boundaries of my form. And yet, when divine, the self permeates the physical world. It's true, the atoms of our bodies grieve each other in death, just like a color takes meaning from other colors. The moon was a changeable star that ruled men's fate. Water was green and not blue to medieval cartographers. The complexity of ochre begs the viewer to grapple with it. We are swiftly becoming an indoor species. Yet scientists know more about outer space than the Earth's oceans. Humans brought the natural world into their homes to combat the rise of machines. Without us knowing, trees converse via latticed fungi. Gender isn't something one is but performs. We are a vast assembly of nerve cells, the continents longing for each other. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much to all of you for those beautiful readings. What a great lineup. I'm prouder of you than ever. Congratulations. Um, if everyone would like to just quickly unmute yourselves to say a quick hello, goodbye on your way out. Uh, join us also next Friday at eight o'clock. Susan Choi will be reading and that's our last uh, public reading of the season. So after that, we'll see you in 2021. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Good night. Beautiful job. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This is incredible. It was great, Maura. You were all wonderful. Thank you so much.